Some of you may remember a video I did a while ago about the white phosphorus controversy in Call of Duty Modern Warfare. For those who didn't or just forgot, it was about how people didn't really think it was that big of a deal that Infinity Ward was reducing a weapon banned by the UN for inflicting countless horrible injuries and deaths to, well, a kill streak. That inclusion felt a bit tasteless to me, so I wanted to dissect the apathy many felt toward that inclusion by looking at how video games depict or present violence as a whole, how some games do it well, how others don't, and what developers can keep in mind when presenting violent or controversial content such as the white phosphorus found in modern warfare. Infinity Ward kind of deflected the issue by saying they weren't really aiming to make any kind of statement by including white phosphorus, that the game itself wasn't inherently political or trying to send any specific message. Modern Warfare is not the only game that hides behind the plausible deniability of not being political. In fact, there's a brand new example of this, and in my opinion, its offenses go far beyond Modern Warfare's. So today, I'm going to be dissecting the game Six Days in Fallujah, specifically the marketing and interviews surrounding it. Considering the game isn't actually out yet, I can't directly analyze the material itself. Which might make you think, well, okay, pointless video then. But there's still enough known about the game, and specifically the people involved with the game, to talk about what it's trying to do in today's landscape. The content of the game is one thing, the context is another, and that's something we can look at right now. In this video, I'm going to go over the game itself, its history, and why it's persevered for as long as it has. And I'm also going to take it even further beyond and cover the subject matter the game is depicting and discuss parts of the Iraq war you may have never known about, as well as politics in video games and modern United States propaganda. You may notice by the runtime of this video that it's a bit of a doozy, but I promise it'll all come together and make sense. At least, I hope it does. My name is Wade Ronspies, and welcome to Input One. Thanks for tuning in. Six Days in Fallujah was a kinda cancelled project set to be published by Konami in 2009, but it was sidelined due to the controversial nature of the game. The plan was to depict events specifically cited by first-hand witnesses from the Second Battle of Fallujah. Not only did people feel that it was a bit too soon to depict and gamify a battle that cost the lives of many American, British, and Iraqi government soldiers, but there was also the issue of trivializing the struggle on the other side of the battle too. The Battle of Fallujah wasn't a clear-cut one side good one side bad ordeal. There were lots of terrible things that happened in that battle, not limited to the use of white phosphorus on and the outright murder of Iraqi civilians. It was a miserable and brutal affair. And in all fairness to the original product, I don't think it was trying to make light of the situation, but I think most people can agree that adapting the story of one of the deadliest military operations of the Iraq war to a third person shooter isn't the most tasteful way to tell that story. There's an inherent goofiness to games, and I think even if we don't want to acknowledge it, we all sort of know it. It's kind of why it's easy to say I love movies when meeting someone for the first time, and a tad embarrassing to say I love video games in the same situation. And yeah, it's silly, but that's the simple truth of the matter. It's hard to make the sentence, I love video games, sound normal in an average casual conversation. Unless, of course, you're talking to a gamer. Plus, there's the unspoken expectation for video games to be fun. To use a bit from my Last of Us Part 2 review, just look at all the people who use Reggie quotes to attack games, like The Last of Us Part 2, for not being quote unquote fun. If it's not fun, why bother? Even today, there's the expectation that, first and foremost, a game should be fun before it is anything else. Ignoring the subtle differences between something that's fun and engaging, but that's beside the point. So to use that medium in 2009, mind you, as a way to tell the story of actual soldiers who experienced the terrible events of Fallujah, you can understand why even people who love video games were a bit hesitant. And you could point at games like The Last of Us, The Walking Dead, God of War, Red Dead Redemption 2, and others and say, you can tell mature and thoughtful stories in games. And hey, I'd agree with you, that's 100% true. But but it's a bit more complicated when you're depicting events that actually transpired, and especially when you're depicting events as described by people who were there, and then presenting their likenesses in a retelling of their own story. As I said earlier, Six Days in Fallujah was essentially cancelled, except it's back. After being all but cancelled in 2009 after Konami backed away from the project, it has returned and is being developed by former Bungie employees who have done work on Halo and Destiny, now under the name Highwire Games. Highwire Games has only one project under their belt as of now, a PSVR game named Gollum. It's a pretty simple first-person exploration slash action game, and it got 
eh, reviews. But hey, it had music from Bungie's own Marty O'Donnell, who we'll get to. But most crucial to the story of the new Six Days in Fallujah is Peter Tamty, the man who helmed development of the original game as president of Atomic Games, which no longer exists. But since the original project lost its publisher, Tamty went on to found Victora, which is now publishing the new Six Days in Fallujah. Oh, and Tamty himself is a former Bungie dev too. So now you have a former Bungie dev publishing a game made by a bunch of former Bungie devs. Make sense? The initial idea for the game was to accurately represent the experience of a United States Marine during the Second Battle of Fallujah in 2004. It wasn't really meant to be a Call of Duty clone or anything, and depending on who from the team you asked, some even considered it to be a horror game, despite others being immensely proud of the frostbite-like destruction engine that allowed players and enemy AI to dynamically decimate entire city blocks. In hindsight, I'm not entirely sure if the original vision for this game would have been that good, to be honest. My guess is that it was probably going to be a very heavily scripted experience. And there were just so many different expectations and ideas from everyone who worked on it, I don't think it would have resulted in a very focused or coherent project. I think it would have suffered from trying to be too many things all at the same time. It just seems like it had a very inconsistent vision. It's a military shooter, but it's a tense, scary game. But it's also an action game with destructive environments and scripted set pieces. But it's also a very serious story. As for the new game, it's hard to tell. Based on what we've seen, it seems like the perspective has shifted to the first person, but other than that, it's not entirely clear. I don't think it'll be much different on a gameplay level than something like Call of Duty. Perhaps it'll be an entire game built around those breach and clear missions in Modern Warfare, which were actually pretty neat, if a bit disturbing at times. And that would kind of excite me if it wasn't for a lot of the issues I have with Six Days in Fallujah on a conceptual level. I can go over how it just kind of makes me uncomfortable to be playing a game based on something that happened in relatively recent memory for some people, and how the enemies I'd be shooting are kind of just dudes in their houses who are upset about the American military occupation of the city. And to be fair, the game seems to be a work of fiction just based on the real battle anyway. And I'm joking when I say that, but I'm also kind of not? Nah, I'll get into it in a little bit. Actually, you know what? Maybe I should just get into it now. Maybe it would help if I explained exactly what happened in in Fallujah, and then why Six Days in Fallujah's revival is a bit sketchy. And I apologize if some of this is a bit basic and not getting all the gritty details down. I'm gonna try to keep this rundown a little short so I don't spend weeks writing and editing this thing, okay? Six Days in Fallujah specifically intends to depict the events of the Second Battle of Fallujah, the follow-up battle to a retaliation effort from the US military after pictures were uncovered depicting the charred corpses of four US private military contractors belonging to a private military company called Blackwater USA, which I'll get to later. Before these deaths even occurred, America had already been heavily involved with the city of Fallujah and its surrounding area. Airstrikes, occupation, even before the battle itself, many civilians in the city were shot and killed by US forces in the ensuing protests that followed their occupation of the city. The occupation of Fallujah was extremely heated, with some local insurgents using RPGs and bombs to kill US soldiers in the area. They weren't exactly pleased that foreign soldiers were occupying their city and, well, their entire country for that matter. After all, if they're here for their war on terror caused by 9-11, then why are they in Iraq? We didn't make the WMDs they're supposedly looking for either. What did we do? So the Blackwater killings weren't necessarily the sole reason America staged a quote-unquote pacification of the city, but it was a reason. Following the declaration that American forces would siege the city after the pictures of the Blackwater contractors were discovered, Fallujah was encircled by over 2,000 Marines, hit by multiple airstrikes, the roads in and out were blockaded, and soldiers began distributing material, asking for any residents of the city to give up anyone involved with the Blackwater killings. This was the first Battle of Fallujah, and it was considered to be the first major combat mission of the Iraq War. It's estimated that over 50 Americans, around 1,500 insurgents, and 600 civilians were killed. It only ended after the US ordered local citizens to keep insurgents out of the city following the chaos. Not sure how they're meant to do that, but hey, their problem now. 
As for the second Battle of Fallujah, which is the battle that Six Days in Fallujah depicts, the number of local insurgents actually grew following the order for the locals to keep the insurgents out, which led to the creation of a coalition force between American, British, and official Iraqi government forces. According to American officials, the insurgent force had grown to over 5,000 soldiers, most of whom were allegedly non-Iraqi. And if you're wondering why that is, when I say insurgent, that means Al-Qaeda. And I know that seems like a gotcha and that this is a black and white conflict. But you have to keep in mind that Al-Qaeda was only there due to the power vacuum created by America destabilizing Iraq to begin with. So the reason a lot of the insurgents in Fallujah weren't locals was because the power struggle in the region attracted insurgents from the surrounding area to try to fill the void being created by coalition troops. Before the second siege of Fallujah, American forces dropped millions of flyers and established a radio station ordering a complete evacuation of the city, stating that any military age male over the age of 12 will be shot on sight. So you can imagine what happened if coalition forces broke into someone's home and saw someone who fit that description, insurgent or not. And let's make it clear, the war in Iraq was never about Al-Qaeda to begin with. Even according to the United States itself, it was primarily about the threat Iraq's non-existent, mind you, WMDs posed to the world. I'm not going to go into raw detail over the battle itself though. I think the footage I'm showing here can give you a good enough idea of the kind of scale and destruction that resulted from the Second Battle of Fallujah. It was devastating, to put it lightly. Over 100 coalition forces were killed, and over 600 more were wounded. Around 1,500 insurgents were killed or wounded. The Red Cross states that around 800 civilians were killed, despite over 200,000 civilians evacuating before the fighting began. White phosphorus was confirmed to have been used, and has since created long-term health issues for many Fallujian citizens in the years after the battle, alongside the enriched uranium used in tank rounds the United States fired. The US denies the use of white phosphorus to target civilians, only enemy combatants. But even if white phosphorus was used specifically against enemy combatants, that's still considered a war crime by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, an organization the United States officially joined in 1997. So the US had to have known, considering they literally joined an organization that deemed the use of white phosphorus a war crime. By their own definition, the American government committed a war crime. But unfortunately, that wasn't the only one. Videos emerged of US soldiers killing wounded Iraqi insurgents. Reports came out stating American soldiers forced military-aged men back into the city only to be inevitably shot on sight later on. It was not a cut and dry good guys versus bad guys battle. It was dirty, messy, controversial, and an incredibly dark period for the people of Iraq who had nothing to do with anything going on. If you didn't evacuate in time, it was entirely likely for your door to be busted down by an American soldier and for your teenage son to be shot and killed. And then they would leave and do it again, door by door, all over the city. And you just had to accept it. Or you could take up arms and seek revenge however you could, which is also one of the reasons why the number of insurgents increased following the First Battle of Fallujah rather than decreased. By the end of the siege, Fallujah was in ruins after countless artillery strikes, fire bombings, and air runs. Nearly one out of every five buildings in the city was destroyed. Many of the civilians who evacuated the city didn't have a home to return to. Even if you look at it from the angle that the coalition forces were there to root out all possible Al-Qaeda threats, the fact of the matter is that war crimes were committed during that battle, and that it had tons of terrible long-term consequences for the innocent people living in Fallujah. The Battle of Fallujah is inherently a controversial subject, and it's been analyzed extensively in the years following its conclusion. You can't talk about Fallujah without acknowledging the truly terrible things that happened there. It's a package deal. And I'm not saying every US soldier was just walking down the street shooting civilians and bombing buildings. I'm saying that even if that wasn't the case 100% of the time, it doesn't change the fact that Fallujah is a very touchy subject. The act of adapting that story to a video game to begin with is dodgy, but to adapt that story and then claim that it won't be quote unquote political commentary, or to say, well, we're just depicting the stories we were told and none of those involved war crimes, it's kind of missing the entire point of the battle and how we look at it through a modern perspective and the obligation we have to upholding the truth of reality. And come on, a depiction of a battle straight from the perspective of actual soldiers who were there featuring voiceover from specific soldiers, and it's not political commentary? Got it. Bread, peanut butter and jelly, not a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. The stuff Highwire doesn't want to show is part of the Battle of Fallujah. It's why that battle has the reputation it has in history. 
You don't get to make a video game about one of the darkest moments in American military history and pretend it's not political. You can't say you spoke to dozens of veterans to create a historically accurate one-to-one -one representation of the events and then remove the parts that make the military explicitly look bad. You can't create an interactive docudrama and not call it commentary either. And that's not an exaggeration. The Steam description of the game states that each mission is narrated by a real person. The game has narration, or as it's also known, commentary. Political commentary, even. And really, it all comes down to how you define political. I think the reason so many creators specifically are hesitant to call their work political is because that would mean you're picking a side on an issue and potentially alienating a portion of your audience. But the only sides with a story like Fallujah is the side of truth and the side of falsehood. And by actively choosing to omit the atrocities of that battle, you choose the side of falsehood. And then there's the other way of defining what's political. In some circles, political is just a way of saying this game has gay people or this game has a woman protagonist. Gender and sexuality politics are the only politics that matter to these circles. And those are the only politics they dislike. Because whether or not they realize it, they probably love politics. They love the idea of societal and ideological conflict or influencing the future of specific areas and factions. Which, surprise, that's politics, baby. Fallout. Political. Final Fantasy VII. Political. Modern Warfare 2. Political. Fire Emblem. Political. Mass Effect. Deus Ex. Political as hell. Skyrim. Also political. There is straight up a scene that makes you mediate negotiations between the Empire and the Stormcloaks in order to put the war on hold while you deal with Alduin, the World Eater. I just made Skyrim political. Sorry. The Last of Us Part 2 is also political, but not because it has two women as leads, one of whom who is gay. It's because it depicts a decrepit society and a multi-layered, complicated conflict between the wolves and scars with no clear beginning or ending. It has a message about humanity, our inherent search for power, and the unending cycle of violence. And yeah, there's some gay and trans characters. It's not about how gay and trans they are, it's just a layer to the story. So when people say they wish games had less politics, well, I'll get to that later, so stick around, I guess. And then you have game publishers trying to maintain the illusion that their games aren't political. Like, for the love of God, The Division 2 literally takes place in Washington, D.C., depicts something often referred to by in-game characters as a civil war and directly references American history pretty much any time it can. And yet, Ubisoft was determined to make it clear that it's not political. It's so milk toast. What they really mean when they say their games aren't political is that there aren't any coherent messages or themes worth extracting from it, which as I'll explain later is still a message. Six days in Fallujah is political. It is depicting politics in action. But because it won't make you think about the US's place in Fallujah and the aftermath of that battle, it's not political apparently. That's why I joked earlier that this game is basically fiction. Because without depicting the truth of what happened there, warts and all, you are essentially depicting a fictional event. You are doing a disservice to reality. And by saying my game about Fallujah is not a political statement, you are making a political statement. And that's before you realize why Six Days in Fallujah isn't really trying to say anything or show anything that might paint the United States in a negative way and why it's coming back in the first place. It all goes back to a man I mentioned earlier, Peter Tamty. Peter Tamty is the founder and CEO of Victura, who is the new publisher of Six Days in Fallujah. In the past, Tamty had actually been contracted by the government to make software with the military. In fact, pretty much his entire history in game development post Halo is involved with making military shooters and working with the government. Before Victura, he helmed Atomic Games, creator of games like Close Combat and Breach. And as for Victura itself, it almost feels like Tamty founded the studio specifically to get this thing out the door once and for all. Just cut out all the middle men and release it. They don't have any other projects, they have no prior history, and as far as I can tell, they don't have anything planned beyond Six Days in Fallujah. This is it. Six Days in Fallujah is why Victura exists to begin with. And I imagine if Victura continues beyond this game, any future projects will probably also be military shooters. It does feel a bit shady, especially considering his history with the government, but Tanthi stated that the reason he has stuck with the project isn't because the United States is funding it, it's just that he feels an obligation to all the people the team interviewed throughout the game's development and for the quote-unquote memory of veterans. Tamthi insists that Six Days in Fallujah is not political. He claims it's about the human experience and not about the quote-unquote things that divide us. 
What he's trying to say is that he wants us to empathize with the soldier in the uniform, but not really get hung up on why they're there to begin with, despite a statement on Victoria's Twitter account that suggests otherwise. And yeah, maybe by just showing the day-to-day -day of a soldier in active combat, that can say a lot about war itself and make players think about how bad it is. But when you look at Call of Duty, Battlefield, Medal of Honor, and more, and how they depict modern warfare, well, it's usually a fleeting thought and not much more. Putting your faith in this game to break the mold is a bit optimistic in my opinion. Tempty says it's about understanding the human cost of war, but on television, Telling the stories of the other side, he said this, Very few people are curious what it's like to be an Iraqi civilian. Nobody's going to play that game, but people are curious what it's like to be in combat. It kind of reminds me of all those boomer Facebook memes. The ones about how men used to be rough, tough, and willing to run across Omaha Beach to save France from the Nazis, and how modern men are upset when Starbucks gets their order wrong, or <laughs> whatever. It's this idea that war is cool. War is badass. War is how you prove you're a real man. War is an inevitable fact of life. You're a hero by being in war. These are people who've gone above and beyond what's expected of them. But it's expected of everyone, right? Because if you're anti-war, that makes you a coward, a traitor, a spineless little bitch. This frappe needs more whipped cream. I demand a refund. As if that's the problem. And not the fact that we have recruitment booths in high school cafeterias to convince struggling students to bleed out in a desert halfway across the globe. No, I'm not curious what it's like to be in combat. I think there's value in understanding that experience, sure. But that's why you have to criticize projects like Six Days in Fallujah that attempt to trivialize the harsh realities of war. The harsh realities that go even farther than seeing your best friend riddled with bullets. Enemy soldiers decimated by shrapnel and entire city blocks razed to the ground. That's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to warfare. That's the stuff you expect. And when Peter Tamty says very few people are curious what it's like to be an Iraqi civilian, he has to be intentionally ignoring games like This War of Mine and Bury Me My Love that tell the gut-wrenching and heartbreaking stories of what it's like to be caught in a war zone, and are undoubtedly much more impactful depictions of war than anything Treyarch or DICE have come up with in all their years, but yeah, okay, sure bud. What he means is that it's not fun to be a civilian, which tells me that, at the end of the day, he wants this game to be fun. And notice I use the word fun instead of engaging, because you can absolutely tell an engaging story about an Iraqi civilian caught in war-torn Fallujah. I mean, it's basically been proven already. It wouldn't be the textbook definition of fun, but why should it be? It also tells me that Peter Tamty doesn't really have the creative vision to understand how deep and complex video games can be, how they don't have to follow a rigid structure or genre to tell an interesting story. He thinks he does, and has for a long time, but when he says stuff like very few people are curious what it's like to be an Iraqi civilian, he clearly doesn't. One of the biggest arguments for this game is that people want to prove that video games can tell difficult stories, but we know they can. They've been doing that for a long time. Mature, thought-provoking, and difficult games have been around for a minute or two. People just want to be able to shoot brown people in one, I guess. Anyway, how can you trust a guy like Peter Tamty to understand what would make for a deep story about the human experience in war if he doesn't really understand what makes the human experience interesting to begin with? Beyond shooting stuff, at least. The way I see it, in his mind, the only way to tell a story about a war zone is to make it a shooter, even though some of the most memorable stories about war have been side-scrollers, survival games, adventure games. There are a million different ways to tell this story, but he and his team went for a shooter. I think that Six Days in Fallujah would make for a much more impactful experience if you did experience the atrocities of that conflict, and maybe did so through the lens of a choose-your-own-adventure game or something with hand-drawn animation, or a straight-up suspense thriller game from the Iraqi or American perspective as some had planned originally. But uh, I forgot. Then I'd be making the Iraq war all political, and that's no good. And if you want to make the player understand the human cost of war, wouldn't it be a good idea to show things from the side that lost the most anyway? It's mind-boggling. I also want to go back to Peter Tamty's involvement with the U.S. government for a second. As I mentioned earlier, he has previously done contract work with the U.S. military, all under the Destineer Studios name. I mean, Atomic Games, the original studio behind Six Days in Fallujah, was owned by Destineer Studios. The straight-up CIA even invested in Destineer and, by proxy, Atomic Games, prior to the release of their game Breach, all after Destineer was having consistent meetings with personnel from the Marine Corps concerning making training systems 
terms for the Marines. The man himself even said that some of his contract work with the military would hit store shelves in interviews with the press. So it's entirely possible that you've played a military funded project without even realizing it, and not just projects from Atomic Games. Destineer and Atomic were fully on board with having their military projects go to retail. So why couldn't Six Days in Fallujah have been one of those? Some articles and sources even suggest that the Marines are the ones who suggested the idea to begin with. And 60s in Fallujah's revival doesn't come out of nowhere either. Tamdi has been trying to get this game made ever since Konami backed out in 2009, filing trademarks in both 2013 and 2017. I understand believing in a project, but holding on to something this long after a long series of losing publisher after publisher, well, the persistence is a bit strange. Now, Tamdi claims that the US government isn't involved Involved with the revival of Six Days in Fallujah, but judging by his history and his personal politics, including his political donations, well, that's kind of doubtful. Oh, and I'm not blindly accusing Tamti of donating to conservative causes. I looked it up. He donated $100 to WinRed, a fundraising platform for the GOP endorsed by Donald Trump, dedicated to helping Republicans win elections. And this wasn't a long time ago, this was last year, just before the 2020 election. So just last year, he was actively and monetarily supporting the GOP and Donald Trump. So you know, no bias or political motivation here. And I'm pretty sure that's the right guy. Unless you could show me another Peter Tamty who is the CEO of Victoria listed on the Federal Election Committee's website. But okay, it's just the guy at the top, right? That doesn't mean the developers themselves suck too, right? Well, Marty O'Donnell of Halo, Destiny, and uh, Gollum fame is actually the audio director at Highwire Games, and he's going to be working on Six Days in Fallujah. And in case you didn't know, Marty O'Donnell is an outspoken conservative, at least based on his own tweets and statements he made while still at Bungie. I don't want to say that Highwire itself is rotten at its core and that all its employees are ultra right-wing nationalists. I'm just saying it's not just one guy who's the problem here. To be fair to them, using the same methods I used to find Peter Tamty's political donations, I also saw that all political donations from Highwire Games were dedicated to left-leaning causes. I kind of empathize with the Bernie supporters at the company essentially having to make American military propaganda while working with Marty O'Donnell and Peter Tamty. Even if none of what I saw about Peter Tamty is true, even if my eyes deceived me, even if he was telling the truth and this game isn't being in part funded by the government, it sure has a lot of the signs that it is. Aside from his history making military funded projects and the potential chance that Six Days in Fallujah began life as something the Marine Corps itself suggested, a lot of the game's PR actually uses specific phrasing and terminology you would only get from something the military has some kind of involvement in. And okay, let's say the military isn't involved with the project and never was. It's clear that Peter Tamty, Victoria, and Highwire Games are adhering to the specific standards that are expected of military funded entertainment projects. Specifically, notice the capitalization of the word soldiers in its Steam description, the same way the Army's official website capitalizes the word. And you know what other game capitalizes the word soldiers? America's Army. You know, the game that is explicitly created by the Army as a way to recruit gamers into the military. And it's not a secret, it is literally recruitment material. Even Wikipedia describes it as propaganda, which is how you know shit's fucked. Which brings me to the part of this video where I completely derail the subject and go back in time and talk about one of the parts of the Battle of Fallujah that is a whole damn thing, Blackwater, USA. Blackwater is its own can of worms. You could make a movie about this stuff. Blackwater USA was a private military company, just like the ones you see in Metal Gear Solid 4. Turns out PMCs aren't just a part of Hideo Kojima's dystopian vision of the future. They're real, and they've been around for a long time. And I say Blackwater was a PMC, but they're still around, just with a different name. Blackwater USA is often blamed for escalating tensions in the Middle East due to their constant presence, all done independently of the US military. Oh, sorry independently of the military. While they're technically a private company, they were in the Middle East because they were contracted by the military to assist with specific operations. The United States knew they were there. In fact, they were paying them to be. So you have what are essentially rent-a-cops with assault rifles and armored vehicles operating with American cash in one of the most intense war zones in the history of the planet. They had helicopters, they were escorting local VIPs, and they were doing it all with tens of millions of dollars in their pocket all courtesy of the US government. This wasn't just an Iraq war thing either. They were even active during Hurricane Katrina to protect government buildings from, 
Uh, people who are starving and the homeless, I guess. Nowadays, they operate in a much more limited capacity after countless hearings, lawsuits, and fines, some of which for allegedly smuggling weapons overseas, tax evasion, supplying foreign powers with military armaments, hardcore drug use, money laundering, killing Iraqi civilians, child prostitution, and even killing their own employees to keep them from testifying in court. It's like a gang in a frat house was given millions of dollars and thousands of guns to play around with. A private army made up of military rejects and gun range heroes from all over the world operating as an unofficial branch of the US military without any kind of government mandated training. All under the pretense that they're not mercenaries, they are loyal Americans. And you might be wondering why the military didn't do anything about Blackwater's involvement in Iraq. Well, it's because Blackwater, as a private company, gave the United States plausible deniability anytime Blackwater did something wrong. Oh, it wasn't us, it was them. Despite us paying them and allowing them to be here, but you know. And if Blackwater sounds weirdly familiar, even if you're sure you're just hearing about them for the first time, just last year, former President Donald Trump pardoned four Blackwater employees who were convicted of killing 17 Iraqi civilians and injuring 20 more in 2007. Not accused, convicted. Because why pretend to not be the bad guy, you know? And you might be wondering why I'm harping so much on Blackwater in the first place, and why it's even relevant to this channel, a channel about video games after all. Well, firstly, I just wanted to explain that, in case you didn't know, the Iraq war and the entire war on terror wasn't a clear-cut good versus bad situation. So presenting it as such is inherently disingenuous to actual historic events. It wasn't just limited to Fallujah. As for the second reason, the... Uh, Blackwater has their own video Video game. I'm not joking. And it was made for the Kinect. That is also not a joke. It cost money and was curiously free of any explicit war crimes. Just implicit ones, of course. It didn't review well, but like, holy shit, this happened. Which brings me to another thing. Brand image and propaganda games. I know the phrase propaganda game seems kind of silly. Like, come on, I think I would know if what I'm hearing, seeing, and playing is propaganda. There's no way anyone would actually buy something like that. But the entire idea of propaganda, at least in the modern era, is to implant ideas in your head without you even realizing. It's kind of like advertising. Sometimes it's pretty obvious, but other times, not so much. I want you to consume a product, so I am persuading you to go out and buy that product. As we well know at this point, advertising can take many different forms. Commercials, product placement in movies, TV shows, and video games, and entire movies, TV shows, and video games. Sometimes even the product itself is advertising for the brand behind it. Star Wars merchandise makes more money than the movies themselves, after all. And to be clear, ad games are not the same thing as propaganda games. While propaganda games are conceptually similar to advertisements, the product isn't Czech cereal or dominoes. It's nationalism, racism, or some other kind of ideological concept. America has propaganda games. Iran, China, Lebanon, even goddamn Nazis have somehow figured out how to make games for their own ideology over the years. So if literal Nazis can learn how to code and make a video game, so can you. Follow your dreams, kids. We can't let those Nazis win. And I gotta give a shout out to Pyongyang Racer, a racing game that doubles as a tourism ad for North Korea. It wasn't exactly made by or paid for by the government, so it's not exactly a propaganda game, but it was made with the intent of creating interest in visiting North Korea. And just look at it, amazing. America has an interesting relationship with propaganda these days. It's not the 1940s anymore. It's not so obvious as looking at a poster and thinking, well, if the government wants me to join the army, then I should probably join the army. And to be fair, World War II, despite setting the stage for one of the most complex political stages in human history, was a pretty simple conflict, at least from an American perspective. Clearly, the threat Nazi Germany presented was severe, and the Imperial Japanese Navy attacked a US Navy base. You didn't really need to do much heavy lifting to convince someone to join the American cause. Obviously, the lines get blurred when you think about the Japanese internment camps, war crimes, and recruitment of Nazi scientists during and after the war, but to the average person, it was a pretty clear and simple example of good versus evil. But these days, war isn't so cut and dry. It may have felt that way in the months and years immediately following 9-11, but it's been nearly 20 years since that day, and we're still involved with the Middle East thanks to something called the War on Terror. Even in high school, 2011 specifically, I remember this sentiment amongst my classmates that they were just kind of tired of this weird rhetoric that was going on around the War on Terror, and why are we even in the Middle East these days anyway? And this was in rural Nebraska. So imagine being the army in this situation. If average Americans and an entire upcoming 
evolving generation of Americans aren't too huge on the current war, then how do you convince people to join the military? Well, you could lie and promise them free college, experience for jobs after the service, and a brand new Dodge Charger. Or you could lie and use something called positive brand association. Something I wanna to touch on real quick before we get into this though, is the difference between advertising and propaganda. Let's say you're proud of where you're from. Nothing wrong with that. I'm proud I'm from small town Nebraska. I feel that it differentiates me from most people in the gaming and YouTube space. I even think it's absolutely worth visiting Lincoln and Omaha, and I'd love to represent them in any way if I ever get the chance. Rent's cheap, the food is good, and the weather, fucking sucks sometimes, I can't lie. Either way, I think it's perfectly normal to be proud of where you're from. That pride turns into propaganda though if I say something like, Nebraska is the best state in all of America. Sure, it's not perfect and it's had its moments in the past, but everything is A-OK -okay right now. I think Pete Ricketts is doing the best job possible and there definitely haven't been any race riots that resulted in straight up lynching and the public hanging of the mayor of Omaha. Nope, never happened. I also think the millions of dollars in political donations to Pete Ricketts and the fact that he's the son of a billionaire is actually great. And for the record, you definitely wouldn't be mentioning half of that stuff if you were making actual propaganda. I'm just giving an example of some of the things that might be omitted or outright spun in order to sound positive. Propaganda is intentionally misleading. The intent is to create a desired mindset or a specific attitude. And like I just mentioned, propaganda isn't just in the creation of material, it's also in the omission or rewriting of material too, specifically for ideological purposes. So something like modern warfare rewriting the infamous highway of death to be the fault of Russia Russia rather than the United States. And yeah, you can make the argument that in modern warfare, it all takes place in a fictional country. But to that I say, why create the exact situation all the way down to the name then? For a game that credits itself for being a harsh, brutal representation of modern combat, why would it take a specific concept from history and sanitize it in favor of the United States? Well, there might be an answer for that, but I'll get to it later. And if the Russian general bad guy in that game is undoubtedly the villain and the whole highway of death situation is partly to blame for that image, then wouldn't that make America the clear villain in real life for actually doing it? Eh, that's too much thinking for this game. Just shoot the bad guys. It's all good. It's all good. And God, don't even get me started on Black Ops Cold War. And to be honest, I don't think I have to. Oh, and as I was writing this, another cool non-political thing happened in the world of Activision and Call of Duty. Activision Blizzard just recently hired former President Bush counterterrorism advisor Francis Townsend as executive vice president for corporate affairs. So someone who was actually involved with the subject matter I've covered in this video now works with the publishers of Call of Duty. Not political, by the way, but back to modern warfare. Why the change? Why take an event with a defined name and change the perpetrator? Well, another layer to this whole thing is the fact that the US military doesn't often allow for the use of specific military branches, iconography, or equipment unless the media in question presents the US in a positive way. And that's because, at least in movies, any use of the US military, its branches, and or weapons, no matter how minor or insignificant, requires final script approval. To explain this, an easy example would be to look at Captain Marvel. Like, it may as well be a two hour long advertisement for the Air Force, but again, there's a reason for that. Film studios have to work with the military if they want to use military equipment like jets, tanks, uniforms, and weapons as props. And in doing so, they have to do that little thing I mentioned before called final script approval. If they don't like the script, change it. If you don't want to change it, then well, no guns, no tanks, no jets to use as props, and no permission to even say the words Air Force. So they're definitely not going to approve something that, let's say, is critical of the Iraq war or explicitly depicts US soldiers committing war crimes. The military won't even allow any sort of allusion to the suicide or homeless rate of veterans. The screenwriters don't even have to come out and say it, but if the Department of Defense thinks that image might pop into someone's head, then that line has to go. That's why in a lot of recent movies, you have these squeaky clean and borderline religious representations of the military, especially in bigger budget movies. They're not going to stand in the military's way. In fact, they want the process of working with the Pentagon to be as smooth as possible. And for the record, I'm not sure if there's anything similar with video games. After all, video games don't need real props or to even use the actual weapons or vehicles. Plus, there are plenty of military shooters made outside of the US, so I doubt the American military could directly involve themselves with foreign projects. It's a bit of a gray zone, but that could be something that's already been happening for a while now, and we just don't know. But for movies, this gets even crazier when you realize that all this stuff applies 
applies to a film's marketing too. There's a channel called Pop Culture Detective that has a great video on this, specifically in regards to Independence Day Resurgence, where part of the marketing involves going to a website and signing in with your Facebook account and then voluntarily giving the army access to its information. As you do, seemingly innocent interactive ads, PR websites, or other kinds of tie-in content can be produced in direct collaboration with the US military specifically to subtly drive recruitment regardless of whether or not you give them access to your account though. But let's say you do use your Facebook account to log into one of these things. What do you think they're doing with your account? They don't just have access to all kinds of personal information. Now they can create advertising specifically targeting you for the sole purpose of recruitment. They have free range to find ways to barrage you with advertisements and material promoting the image of the military to make enlistment sound enticing. Like after just a day of looking up army stuff for this video, I started getting army ads on random websites. So I can't even imagine what would happen in Google ads if they straight up had your Facebook account information. There's also this thing in advertising I mentioned way back called positive brand association. Finally getting to that bit where basically you connect your brand with another brand that you know people like and your brand gets some of that same positive attention. It's a subconscious thing like Mountain Dew and Halo. KLI works on me. You can't have one without the other, right? That was intentional by Mountain Dew to make people, well, drink more Mountain Dew. You attach or associate with a positive brand people love and people will associate you with that brand and then they will in turn have a positive association with your brand. And as Pop Culture Detective notes, signing away a significant portion of your life to the army is way different than buying a bag of Doritos. But again, it just comes down to positive brand association. The army is a brand and they want people to think it is good. The more you start to think of the military as a brand, the more a lot of this stuff starts to make sense too. Just look at some of the ads the army is pumping out these days. They're specifically targeting a new generation, sure, but they're also targeting a specific subsection of people and have been for a long time, gamers. It's just that instead of making branded video games, now they're trying to co-opt certain ideas, concepts, and lingo to make it seem like they get it. I mean, why else did they start a Twitch channel? They want you to think that they have you and your best interests in mind. They're just like you, they play video games. And a lot of their positive brand association doesn't even have anything to do with movies or other entertainment that specifically depicts the military. They'll latch onto stuff the same way pizza rolls do with Call of Duty. What do pizza rolls have to do with Call of Duty? Well, what does football have to do with the army? Why would the army and navy have football teams? Seeing the soldiers on the sidelines watching us made me feel like I needed to push even harder because the work that we do on the football field is nothing compared to what they do for us. And to make it clear, everything they're doing here is a big lie. They just want recruits and they're willing to lie to make that happen. The military knows life sucks in the military, but they don't want you to know that. They will lie about enlistment bonuses, college tuition, work hazards, but I'm getting away from the point here. The reality is, to quote Pop Culture Detective, Fiction can be a very powerful and very effective way to influence people's actions and attitudes. People love video games for a reason, you know? They're fiction, and they undoubtedly influence people's emotions both negatively or positively. Just look at how many people shit on Neil Druckmann on a daily basis, or how many people, like me, fight so hard to get people to play stuff like Yakuza or Shin Megami Tensei. Fiction affects us, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. Which is why it's dangerous to simply accept games under the pretense that, well, I just don't want to think about politics or hard stuff or whatever. Even fiction that seems apolitical will affect you in some way. And when that fiction is depicting a falsehood, it has the dangerous opportunity to influence and or reinforce your attitude or opinion on certain people and ideas. Which is to say, it has the opportunity to be propaganda. The military knows the power of fiction. Nazis know the power of fiction. We know the power of fiction. Just look at how many people get Legend of Zelda tattoos or travel the country just to sweat profusely in an expensive cosplay of an anime character at a convention. Or at least how they used to. But when that power is used to misrepresent events and ideas, on purpose or not, it can have a similar effect. But instead of inspiring you to go for the half tuck so you can look like Nathan Drake or to buy an expensive figurine of your favorite anime waifu, it can influence you to accept falsehoods, minimize atrocities, resist anything with powerful messages, and even affect your perception towards women, people of color, or people in the gay or trans community. 
I talked about something like this in a video series I'm deeply proud of called Growing Up With Gaming. In that series, I wanted to dispel the myth that video games cause violence, but I also pointed out that while video games don't cause violence on their own, they can implant ideas about violence in your head, and so can movies or music too. The idea is that after you play a violent video game or watch a violent movie, the likelihood that you think about violent things is increased. And while that doesn't have a direct correlation with actually acting on those thoughts, the fact of the matter is that those thoughts are there swimming around in your mind. Or at least it's more likely they'll be there. So I hope you can at least begin to understand the weight of using games to express certain concepts, philosophies, or other ideas. If video games can increase the likelihood of you thinking about violence, then why can't they increase the likelihood of you thinking about militaries, countries, and concepts like nationalism in a positive way, all without you even realizing? It's a scary thought, and it's why I feel it's necessary to call out games like Six Days in Fallujah and Modern Warfare for misrepresenting or omitting parts of our reality. Like it or not, this stuff has an effect on people. And as much as you probably don't want to admit it, you are not immune from it either. I think that's also why some people are so antagonized at the thought of games having pro-LGBT plus messages, pro-women or minority empowerment messages, pro-income equality messages. They know the power this stuff can have on the mind, and they fear succumbing to it. It goes back to what I said earlier about how there are groups of people who feel that something is only political when it depicts more left-leaning issues or representations of specific social and ethnic groups. I think it's because they fear having some of their views challenged or even out right changed. But just as video games can be used to spread negative ideas and false perceptions surrounding certain topics, they can also be used as a source of positivity and learning. I gave some examples of some positive influences just a few moments ago, like changing your style to match a certain protagonist or getting a tattoo of your favorite game, but it goes so much deeper than that. It can be adopting certain character traits of a character you admire, like the drive and motivation of a strong protagonist, feeling less alone because you see someone like you on the screen, understanding different cultures and social situations, admiring the unique differences between certain places. These are ultimately good things that games and other kinds of entertainment can make you think about without you even realizing. Death Death Stranding is about the importance of human connection. Persona 5 is about standing out despite society telling you to blend in. Fallout is a warning about extreme nationalism and American jingoism. Final Fantasy 7 is about being mindful of the environment and the role corporations play in destroying it. The Last of Us Part 2 is about the unending cycle of violence and how hard it can be to process grief and guilt. Yakuza 6 is about the legacies we leave behind and the impact we have on the people who look up to us. Video games have the potential to have really important messages about the human experience and our modern society, and we should at least try to appreciate that instead of fearing it. Like I said moments ago, when someone says they don't want games to be political, I honestly believe it's because they're fearful of messages that have the potential to make them change or at least challenge their current beliefs. Because hey, change is scary. I think it could be natural or instinctive to be resistant to change, but some change is necessary, I think. And yeah, you could call it brainwashing or tweet at Neil Druckmann for making gay propaganda or whatever. But again, the fact of the matter is that fiction will influence you in some way. And that's something that developers need to understand just as much as the people who play their games. When you say your clearly political game isn't political, what are you saying? Are you saying war itself isn't political? And like people truly feel that way. And I think part of it comes from this illusion developers and publishers create in order to not antagonize people of certain political beliefs and keep them buying their games. And I think it's okay to not want every game to have some kind of message. It's okay to not want to think. Life is hard. Sometimes you need to turn your brain off and reset. But whether you like it or not, you are still getting messages. No message is still a message when it comes to entertainment, especially when you're actively looking for something lowbrow. It can send the message that even having a message is liberal brainwashing or whatever. So to wrap this whole thing up and come to some sort of cohesive conclusion, is Six Days in Fallujah propaganda? It's complicated, but for a concrete answer, I do think it's dangerous. To omit harsh realities and present this infamous historical event in a heavy yet sanitized way not only sends the message that you don't want to push any buttons, but also that you're afraid to acknowledge hard truths that will challenge the way you think about an institution that has tried so hard in very subtle ways to look like the good guys. And for the record, I feel it necessary to say that Highwire and Victoria say they'll donate a portion of proceeds from Six Days in Fallujah to organizations supporting coalition service members who have been most affected by the 
the war on terror. As far as what organizations those will be, I don't know, but using the proceeds for your definitely not political game and then donating them to a totally apolitical cause like veterans affected by PTSD or homelessness, isn't that kind of a direct acknowledgement that your game is political? I guess the big takeaway from all this is just be wary of what people are trying to say with their games and what they're really saying when they aren't saying anything. Every game has some kind of message, even if there's the illusion that there isn't. You are not immune to these messages, even if there isn't one. Think about what someone means when they say something is or isn't political. Because sometimes, by saying nothing, they're saying everything. Thank you for watching. I know this is probably the most intense video I've made in a long time, maybe ever, but it says things I've wanted to get off my chest for a long time. I just didn't really have a great opportunity to do so or a lens to look at it through. Even if you watched this whole thing and hated literally everything I just said, I still appreciate you taking the time and watching this video. I don't have the financial support of something like Patreon to make these videos happen, so this was 100% a project made through pure passion and intrigue. So because this video was not made possible by my patrons, please consider subscribing to my Patreon or at least sharing it and telling someone about the channel. I actually just reopened my Patreon, so if you do want to financially support me through that, I would very much appreciate it. Well, that's that. I hope this video made even a little bit of sense. Thanks again. This has been Input One. Stay tuned.